Hi, Noshers. My name is Micah, the host of Not Your Bubby's Nosh, a conversation about your favorite and least favorite Jewish foods, your go-to source for holiday meal inspiration and a place to discuss and kvetch about which Bubby made it best. Welcome, Noshers. We are here with a special guest from here in the Bay Area. I am joined today by Beth Lee. Beth and I first met this past summer at the Napa Food and Wine Festival, or should I say Jewish Food and Wine Festival, where we noshed, we sipped, and we sold our respective books, my children's book and her Jewish baking book, which we'll learn more about today. If you don't know who Beth is already, and I hope that you do because she's pretty darn fantastic, Beth grew up on the East Coast before moving to Northern California, far away from the traditional Jewish food that she was raised on. She attended UC Berkeley and got her degree in business and she pursued marketing in Silicon Valley. In 2010, Beth realized she preferred pita chips over computer chips, and she launched her food blog, OMG Yummy. Through her blog, she reconnected with her love of cooking and her passion for documenting her family's multicultural food traditions, which are so fun to learn about and she'll chat about today. Her first cookbook, The Essential Jewish Baking Cookbook, came out in August 2021. Her blog and book have been featured in the New York Times, LA Times, San Francisco Chronicle, San Jose Mercury News, The Forward, and she's been on many podcasts and blogs. She also co-leads a popular virtual cooking group called Tasting Jerusalem, which focuses on Middle Eastern cuisine and ingredients. And she does admit that she can make a great New York style bagel here in her Northern Californian kitchen. So thank you so much, Beth, for joining us. I really appreciate you being here and just sharing your wealth of knowledge when it comes to Jewish food and cooking in general. Thank you so much for having me, Mike. I'm so excited to be here. I never tire of talking about food, Jewish food, all kinds of food. So I'm thrilled to be here and chat with you. So Beth, so we are both in Northern California, myself in San Francisco and you in the South Bay, but you're not from here. Tell me about the reason you came to Northern California and what it was like once you got here, what maybe the differences were from your upbringing um, from the Eastern U.S.? Sure. So uh, I've been here for a long time, but my family grew up on the East Coast. My mom was one of six kids, but she was a little bit, let's say, the black sheep of the family. And she and my dad moved away because all of her family was in New York City. And then they moved away to several places on the East Coast, but ended up in Massachusetts. So I was born and raised in Massachusetts, uh, far away even there from like the typical, you know, the, the, the type of life that she grew up in in New York City. Um, but it was a great place to grow up. And we used to go visit my relatives in New York City and New Jersey frequently. Um, I also had on my dad's side family in Boston. Um, so that's where I was for the good or for the early part of my life. And then my dad, it was really kind of simple. My dad was transferred to California and that was like, oh my gosh, someone from this, my mom's family, original family name is Reich. Someone from the Reich family is leaving and going all the way across the country. And, uh, but we did it and my mom was thrilled to do it. Uh, we moved out here in the seventies, um, giving away my age a little bit. And I've been here ever since, and so is all of my family. I have three older brothers, and uh, my dad uh, sadly passed away early this year at 94, but my mom is still alive at 93 and still living in the house that we grew up in once we came out here in Sunnyvale. And I have three brothers, one of them in Northern California and two in Southern California. So we are all um, sort of you know, absolutely converted to being uh, West Coast people. I mean, you can't beat California weather. So I think you made the right choice with the family being out here. Yeah, I mean, it was, I mean, I'll tell you, I was there long enough. And while I appreciated that it was a really beautiful place to grow up and I loved being near, you know, much closer to my relatives than I am now, uh, it was, the weather was tough. I mean, it rained, it snowed as late as May sometimes in Pittsfield. I grew up in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, in the western side of Massachusetts. And yeah, it was, the weather was tough, really tough compared to here. <laughs> and what was the Jewish community like where you grew up? 
So where I grew up uh, specifically in Western Massachusetts in Pittsfield, there was a Jewish community, but not, I was more like the side of town I lived in and where I went to school, like when I took a day off for a Jewish holiday, like Yom Kippur or Rosh Hashanah, there was like only one desk empty in the classroom, maybe two. So I didn't grow up in a neighborhood that was full of Jews. But when I would go to New York City, I experienced more what my mom grew up with and my dad too, where there were, you know, that there were a lot of Jewish neighborhoods and it was easy to find kosher meat. Like, like when I grew up in, in Massachusetts, my mom used to actually still buy kosher meat. We, she stopped doing that when we moved to California. It's like she left it all behind when we came out here. But we used to take a ride once a year to, I think, Albany, New York, because that was the only place we could get kosher meat. And they'd buy like a side of beef and put it in a freezer because my mom still ate kosher meat and that was the only place to get it. So even though I was East Coast, I was not in the heart of a Jewish neighborhood. But I would describe even coming to California, like it's different now, like in Sunnyvale where we, my mom still lives where I went to middle school and high school. um, There is now like, for example, a really large community of Israelis, for example, there. But when I was growing up, there was not, there were not, a. it was again, like if I took a day off for a Jewish holiday, there was not a lot of other empty chairs in the classroom. So I have not been lucky to ever live in a neighborhood. I don't know if I've been, I wouldn't say I've been unlucky, but I've never happened to live in a neighborhood that was just filled with other Jews. But I've always had my support system, either if not physically close to me, then, you know, and I found them and, and, um, am able to, you know, like right now I would say I would have, I have sort of a Havara up in San Mateo, uh, about 45 minutes north of here, and then some people in the East Bay. And so, yeah, I find my, I find my group uh, to celebrate with and such. Yeah. So you've not always been in the food world. So tell us a little bit about that, maybe what you did before and how you got into the food scene. The journey to here. So very, um, maybe not what people would expect. I have more of a typical Silicon Valley story. So so when we moved out here, we went to Sunnyvale and then I ended up going to college in Berkeley. And then I um, moved back down to the Sunnyvale area and then West San Jose. And then we ended up here in South San Jose. So I've always been really in Silicon Valley. And I was I I was in marketing communications for primarily high-tech companies. I worked on the client side. I worked on the agency side and ad agency. I worked at startups. I started my own consulting company, all marketing, um, and again, primarily high-tech companies. And then I had to take a little break for a while for family reasons. And in 2010, as I like to tell the story, I just pretty much decided that I prefer pita chips to memory chips and decided to start writing about food. So after all those years of hiring other people to be the creative people on projects. So hiring writers, hiring photographers, hiring the the people that were creating the art and the content. I became a content creator myself. I realized that there was, you know, I'm really good project manager and really good at working with people. And, you know, I was great at work you know, make giving clients what they figuring out how to get clients what they wanted on budget and on time. But I realized, wow, I could be the writer that I was hiring. And I really felt fo- I feel so much more fulfilled being a content creator and and also connecting finally with my passion for food, which is really what the blog helped me do. So tell me more about that. Did you start the blog as a side hustle or did you just say, you know what, I'm going 110% in, quit my job and just we're doing this from now on? What did that look like for you? 
Also, that's a great question because I always tell people that even though I spent probably 20 years doing marketing strategy, marketing plans, managing projects, figuring out how I was going to, you know, what was the mark, what were the messages, what were, you know, what, what did all that look like? I really started this on a whim, my blog, Oh My God Yummy, omgyummy.com. I really started it on a whim. It was like sitting in the, in the, family room on like a Sunday afternoon. And the kids were like, you know, you should start writing about food. You should just start a blog. And we looked up names and we noticed that people always, whenever we were eating with people, they'd say, oh my God, that's yummy. And, and, and we as a family realized that we loved, like, for example, when we travel, we would plan our food and do all of the sightseeing in between. That was more how our, our trips went. So they just said, mom, you love this. Just start writing about food. And so it was, I didn't really have a plan, but once I got into it, once I started blogging, one of my blog posts got featured on the WordPress homepage and went a little crazy. And, and I went to a blogging conference. I met Dory Greenspan and a whole bunch of other people that I'm still friends with And she had such an impact on me because she was so incredibly kind and welcoming and wonderful to talk to. And I made so many other friends I'm still friends with in this business that I realized, wow, if this is what the food business is like, I want to be in this business. I I love the food. I love the people. I love the learning. I love the camaraderie. And I just decided to start focusing on how to make a business in the food you know, in the food arena. And at that time, social media was really starting, just really kind of in its infancy. So I started going to conferences and just in a way, I like to say I got my MBA in in all of this blogging and social media by just going to conferences and webinars and learning, 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 doing, 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 and just kind of felt my way through. I've done a lot of writing for publications, magazines, um, online. every Everything that I've done has kind of helped me figure out where I want to be in this business. Uh, and uh, it, so it was kind of organic, I guess would be the answer. I didn't have a plan. And in a way, things keep changing so quickly in this business and the way that you can connect with people and share what you love and share what you do that I am constantly evaluating like where and, and still learning, like where my strengths are, what I want to focus on, what's next. Um, but I'm getting, I think I'm getting smarter about it. And, and I still love it now as much as I did from the very first day I started writing my blog. And it is truly such a dynamic field to be in. You have to be creative. You have to be agile, adaptable. You have to be all of these things. And at the end of the day, you still have to be really passionate about what you do because people will know if you're not into it. I always say that I make a holiday meal for 30 plus people every single day. Then I wake up and do it again. And guess who's doing the dishes? So it's really mentally stimulating. It's physically exhausting, but you don't do it if you don't love it. So I love that we have this this love and passion for food and sharing it in common. And starting in 2010, first of all, this space wasn't what it is today. People were finding success and longstanding careers at that time, but it wasn't as well known. So to be able to get in on that ground floor and really see how the industry and field has changed and grown That is such a valuable perspective to have because you've seen it all. So I I think that that's really amazing that you started in 2010 and just took a chance. I really didn't have a plan except that I would write about, this is really, this is the truth. I would write about whatever was either making me or someone around me say, oh my God, yummy. Like what was inspiring to me because I wanted to inspire other people to either go out and enjoy food or get in the kitchen and make food. And I've really always been a very eclectic cook. I've been very comfortable always, not just with the Jewish, in fact, Ashkenazi Jewish food that I grew up with, but with all kinds of foods. And maybe part of it is that uh, probably moving to California definitely, well, it definitely put me in a more diverse um, 
uh, cultural environment. And from the beginning of college, I, I lived with um, like my, my first roommate was Japanese. My next roommate was of Chinese. She's American born Chinese. And then I met my husband, who's a Korean American. Uh, I've always been comfortable with really almost any kind of food. I love going to grocery stores of all different cultural backgrounds. Uh, I have uh, Indian stores and Middle Eastern stores. So I feel really comfortable with all kinds of food. And I couldn't really imagine myself niching down to only one kind of food. And yet, if you go to early posts on my blog, you'll see that one of the things that really motivated me early on was a conference a, com- um, a conference session I went to at Blogger Food 10, where they talked about like the, the I, with the, you know, what happened with food in the United States in like the starting in the 50s, like how did we end up with all this processed food? And, and it made me think about my mother's family background. My grandmother is a huge inspiration to me and you'll read about, you can read about her in my book, but she was a prolific baker and she had six children. Four of them were women. None of them learned to bake. And I always wondered why was that? And in this session, I kind of realized like when processed foods came into play and it became less, you know, um, uh, wonderful to be in the kitchen making things from scratch, that that was kind of the era that my mom and her sisters grew up in. So there went all the home baking. And then it became really inspiring to me to get comfortable with baking and not have that skip another generation. So there was the influence of my grandmother, who was very much you know, raised as an Orthodox Jew. So there's where kind of my passion for the Jewish food also came into play and baking. So I'm, I'm eclectic. I love to cook all kinds of things. I also fell in love with Middle Eastern food. So somewhere in like a few years after I started my blog, I went to a Lebanese restaurant and I tasted za'atar and I practically tackled the waiter and said, what is this? And that's when my love for Middle Eastern ingredients, which then connects me back to, I mean, to to my Jewish roots and realizing that Jewish food was so much more than Ashkenazi food. So that is a long answer all to say um, that I kind of found all of this through my blog. And I didn't start out thinking, oh, I'm only going to write about Jewish food. And if you go to my blog, you'll see I don't only write about Jewish food. I write about, it's still very eclectic. I've been writing more and more about my husband's family's food because it's just as important to me to carry that on. And I still love cooking almost anything. You know, you might find me making a Thai curry one night and um, the next night I might be making, you know, matzo ball soup. Like that's kind of how we roll in my house. That's kind of a long answer to say that uh, I still kind of refuse to niche down to one thing. I've had people tell me over the years, oh, you really need to niche down in your blog. But part of what I am is somebody who loves, um, I mean, I'm in a multicultural family and I feel like representing that and, and exploring that. It also leads me to find that there's more connections between all these disparate, apparently disparate foods and food food cultures than we think. And I always want to keep exploring that. That's part of who my family is and it's part of who I am. And I like to share that with people. So with your Jewish baking book and some of your recipes, they are quite Jewish adjacent, which is something I've started to call my own recipes because I feel like that's the perfect way to describe what I do is Jewish adjacent. I think I should coin that term. But anyways, was that always your intention to have a Jewish blog or a focus on Jewish food? And if so or not, what was the first intention and what did that look like? Oh, yes. Yes. So uh, for 18 Doors, I did a um, everything bagel lock pokey bowl sort of thing. So the, the, the pokey part of it, I use smoked salmon instead of what would be, you know, fresh ahi tuna or something if you were in Hawaii. Um, eating poke in Hawaii is one of our favorite things to do. So my husband's family, he's was originally from Korea, but is 
parents are both from Hawaii. So we spend a lot of time um, in Hawaii. And yes, so I decided to do something that really spoke to both sides of our family and, you know, did an everything bagel seasoning, which I, I know you love. And it's really just fun to do to take those, to take like the sauce I might use on uh, fresh ahi tuna, but use the smoked salmon and the colors. And, and a little bit of that idea came from when in, in this um, Bay Area Jewish Food Professionals group, which I think you're also in the Illuminati, and they did a Jew Asian event once, and I was one of the chefs there, and I did something called that really stretched my um, my recipe making skills, and I loved it. Uh, so the the Korean version of like a pot sticker is, or you know whatever you whichever kind of dumpling you might be familiar with on the Asian side of things, my in a, in Korea it's called a mandu. So uh, I came up with what I called a Jew mandu. Uh, and, and, I, and the side dishes I made with it, I called hapa panchan. So panchan are side dishes in Korean and hapa means half and half, which is what they might call our kids in Hawaii. So uh, I came up with this um, uh, mandu, but I made, I made braised brisket to go inside of it. And then the side dishes, I made like a pickled onion and and a pickled cucumber and what was the third thing? And I kind of brought together a little bit of the Jewish flavors in that and the like the Korean Hawaiian side dish flavors. So it was super, super fun. And I love doing that. That's really inspiring to hear. And it's always fun to learn about where people are getting inspired themselves. And I really love how you have been able to share your cultures and your family's cultural um, recipes as well. I've noticed that you've done some like a smoked salmon poke bowl and just different ways to infuse your recipes with the foods that your family eats, both your husband's family and your upbringing. The more different types of foods that you eat, the more you find connections you know, among the different types of food rather than the differences in some ways. Personally, if there is one food out there that I crave all the time, it is Korean food. I love everything about it. I love all the pickled things, obviously. And if I could bathe in a vat of kimchi, I would do it. There'd be no shame in that. Right, right. And the, and the flavors, are so, there's so much umami in it that, you know, it's like when you go out, is it Southern Indian food when they make the, the plates. I mean, the first time I went out for that, I mean, there's no meat involved at all. The flavors are so intensely amazing. Like it, and it's so satisfying. Every little thing you put in your mouth has a different flavor and a different texture. And you just realize there's this whole, there's this whole world of flavor that you can create with, with spices, with, with just so many other things besides just, you know, sort of the, um, maybe the more simple kinds of foods that I grew up with, which I'm all for the comfort foods and everything, but wow. I mean, experience, learning about a new flavor or ingredient to me is that's just, I love it. Makes me happy. Okay. Now you're just hitting on all of my favorite foods from Korean and South Indian. That's got to be one of my favorites. Fun fact at me and my husband's wedding, we actually had uh, South Indian food because we would go all the time to this one particular restaurant in Toronto. And it was such a special place for us. So those two things and Jewish food, of course, um, as a food group, but love this for us. Okay, let's bring it back into Jewish food. Let's talk about your cookbook, The Essential Jewish Baking, that came out in August 2021. Tell us more about that. What was the process like? I want to hear it all. So it's, so this is an interesting story. So it's uh, The Essential Jewish Baking Cookbook. Uh, I think it's 50 traditional recipes you think I'd remember for every, for every, for every occasion. I should know that. 50 traditional recipes for every occasion, the essential Jewish baking cookbook. Uh, it came about, the publisher actually found me and I was already working on a proposal for a cookbook, not that particular one. 
the publisher came to me. It was right in the middle. We were still pretty much in lockdown, December, not total lockdown, but it was December 2020. Still really, everybody was mostly at home. We weren't traveling. And I was kind of blown away by how well I thought the book fit me, even though I don't only write about baking and I don't only write about Jewish food. It's certainly a passion and love of mine. And it certainly connects me to my my bubby, my grandma, who was the prolific baker. And so it just, there. It I, I kind of am one of those people that goes with gut instinct. And my gut was telling me I need to write this book. But the schedule was incredibly aggressive. So they came to me in December of 2020. The schedule, if I accepted the offer, was to start writing it in January, mid-January. And I had to have the first draft done by the end of March. And there's 50 recipes in it. And it, I was a little bit scared to death, but I was just one of those things that I just knew I had to do it. I, it had, I had to say yes. So the first thing you do really once you, I mean, if you're writing a proposal, you'll already have this in the proposal. But in this case, we finalized, the publisher had an idea of what they wanted the sections to be, but then I really had to work on the recipe list. And one of the things I love most about the book is it doesn't just cover Ashkenazi food, which is what I grew up with. There's a lot of Sephardic recipes in there and Mizrahi recipes in there. So it really stretched me to connect out with the people I knew and in Facebook groups and find out what what would be the essential recipes that a Sephardic Jew might be interested in or a Mizrahi Jew and of course an Ashkenazic Jew. So it was really fun to do the research and figure out what that recipe list was going to be. And then from there, I just started baking, 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 baking. And the way I worked through it, I had tons of cookbooks I was using as resources, of course, online, Facebook groups. And then I was texting like crazy with people that I was connected with, um, who then would connect me with other people. And I also had a huge group of testers in such a short amount of time. I've talked with some people who in that amount of time might skip that step, but there was no way I was going to skip that step. So I had a huge group of testers, I don't know, about 30 people. So as fast as I could get a recipe out to a point where it was ready for someone else to look at it, the recipes would go out and I'd move on to the next thing. I also used my neighborhood as kind of an initial testing. We, you know, we weren't all sitting together inside homes, but we'd set up like a table outside and I'd text my neighbors and say, okay, there's five more things for you to taste, come over. And we'd have like a six foot table set out and they'd taste at one end. And, you know, so it was really, I loved it. It was insanely quick. It was stressful, but I learned so much, Micah. I just can't even tell you. And I connected with, um, you know, like a fr- like a friend I went to college with. There, ha- they are of Sephardic background, and I spent time with her mom on the phone, learning about biscochos and sending texts to her cousin, who then would send them to her mom. And I'd say, are these are these Roscas rolls? Do they look right? Yes, they look right. And here's what ours looked like. And they text me back. It was just incredible. I I loved every bit of it. It was a little um, crazy. I'm not sure that I would like my next cookbook to happen that quickly. Um, But by, we edited from like the end of March through like mid-June. And then by August, the book was out. And uh, it was, it was fantastic. I got, you know, I I mean, I was so lucky. I even got in the New York Times and Florence Fabricant's column, uh, I, it it was just an incredible experience and I loved it. And people are still writing to me about it. People are, thank gosh, thank God, still writing, buying the book. And um, a lot of people that aren't Jewish love the book. I, I encourage people. I mean, obviously for this podcast, there are going to be a lot of people listening who are Jewish. So please buy it and bake from it. But if you're not Jewish, I have a neighbor around the corner, corner who's Japanese American and it spurred her on to start baking again. And the very first thing she baked from it were the Sephardic rolls called Raskas. Nothing from her background, but she texted me and she's like, I'm so motivated to bake. Thank you for this, Beth. And that those kinds of that kind of comment 
like that can keep me going for a year. I mean, it just makes me so, so happy. If I have to pick one, I would say it would be Bubby's Hala because that recipe, like tackling that recipe and figuring out how to come as close as possible to what she made was sort of a lifelong goal for me. And it really is a great challah. It came out, it comes out just so fantastic. It makes two beautiful loaves or, you know, one gigantic one, uh, however you want to do it. So I guess if I had to pick one, it would be that one. It really connects me with her. Uh, and it really felt like such an accomplishment. But of course, the babka, I mean, which is on the cover. I mean, who doesn't love babka? Uh, and uh, one other thing I want to mention to people, make the pretzel. I mean, that is like, I don't know why they stopped making pretzels in Jewish bakeries, but all the time people say, oh my gosh, you can't find a pretzel anymore. And basically what it is, it's kind of like if an onion roll and focaccia like got together and had a baby, that's what a pretzel is. It's not hard to make. It's just so yummy and delicious. Um, kind of connected to a Bialy a little bit, but in more of a focaccia in a big form. And if you're having a brunch, what a great thing to make. Um, then you can just cut it up into squares and serve it with, you know, be great with locks and whatever. So anyways, but if you're making me pick one, it would be Bobby's challah. And do you have any recipes that you really, really wanted to get in the book, but once you started testing, you were just like, you know what, this is just not in the cards for me? The last recipe I made for the book, and it is in the book, but I am answering your question, I promise. So it's the teglach, which is also something you cannot find anymore, but used to be made a long time ago in more on the East Coast, I think, than the West Coast. Like my rabbi asked me to put it in there because she grew up with it and she can't find it anymore. Well, that recipe was my last recipe I created. It was so hard. It was so hard to make because I couldn't find anything that really gave specific enough instructions. But that one made it in there and it works and it's a good recipe. But there were moments when I wanted to call my editor and say, um... <laughs> Do we really want this in here? It was a tough, tough recipe because you're dealing with boiling um, honey, which then gets to this candy stage. And if you don't stop it soon enough. So, but that did make it in there. There was another one that we thought about putting in um, called Kubina, which is the Yemenite version of kind of a challah type of bread. And I... I decided it was a little too complicated for the book because we really tried to focus on a, not only essential, but also just generally very approachable types of recipes. And looking at our time frame and the hollow recipes we already had in there, I was a little afraid that all that you do all these little individual rolls and then depending on how you approach it, it sits like overnight. And it seemed a little too complicated for I guess I'll call this volume one. Maybe it would make it into volume two. And I kind of regret that it's not in there. I think it's a fantastic recipe that I want to learn. And then there was a Flodny, which is the Hungarian layered cake. And I, that one, I also said, yeah, I mean, you it's not hard. It's complicated though. Like you have to make each individual layer and then, you know, there's like cream and there's different things in between. And it seemed just a little bit too much for the book. Like not, not hard, but it seemed like it didn't quite fit in with the level I, we were trying to keep all the recipes at. So that's, that's my answer for that question. Flodney and Kubina didn't make it in, but uh, I highly recommend learning about them if you're interested. And I hope to do another book someday that maybe I can bring those in. And I think that brings up a really great point as I currently am writing a manuscript for my first cookbook out in spring 2024. And the purpose of a cookbook is really for people to see these recipes as accessible and use them, use every single page of that cookbook so it becomes splattered with oil, ketchup, whatever. And sometimes there's a recipe that we as writers are really passionate about and love. But for the reader, it might not make sense and it might not be as simple or accessible for them to make at home. So while a recipe like Flodney maybe didn't make it in, 
it's still a fantastic recipe and a fantastic dish and hopefully for your second cookbook. And it really shows just the thought and care that go into writing books. And on that note, I hope that everyone listening buys your book, at least 10 books, buy books for 10 of your friends, buy 10 books a month, and just support the authors and the creators that you love to watch and digest their content. So everyone buy the book. No excuses. Check on Amazon, check your local bookstore, check wherever you buy your books and buy them for a holiday, a birthday, a mitzvah, and anything. It truly is a beautiful book and the photography is fantastic, especially that Bubka on the front. What was the photography process like? Yeah, thank you. I was really lucky. They, you know, again, because of, of the the timing of it and also COVID, uh, I wasn't at the shoot, but um, they picked Annie Martin to do the photography and she's just a wonderful photographer and I sent a lot of pictures. I snapped a lot of pictures while I was developing recipes. And so I sent pictures showing them this is what it should look like when it's baked. But all the baking was done, you know, by the team. And I was just like floored by how it came out. I mean, the first picture I saw was of the Bialis that spread with the locks on it and everything. And I will say there was a tear or two that went down my face. Uh, it, it's really beautiful. And they the, the Bialis came out great. And I want to encourage people, make a Bialy. Oh my gosh, those are not easy to find on the West Coast, but they're so good. Make a Bialy, people. <laughs> they're wonderful. If you take anything away from this conversation, it is that you must make a Bialy and a Pletzel. Those two things and to buy a lot of books. Right. And by the way, the onions you make for the pretzel, you can use on your Bialy. So we're, we're making like a little with really efficient kind of um, use of your, your time in the kitchen. Just a little point of reference. What I always do with caramelized onions is I'll just make a whole big batch. Like I'm talking a full two pound bag of onions and then just portion them in to containers for the pay depending on how many onions I made, freeze them and then just use them for everything. That's my hack for you. Yes, and you wear glasses like me. So when you get those tears, you now can't see through your glasses and you got to clean your glasses. It's a whole process. Well, between the cutting, the tears, the smell, I just, (laughs) I only want to do that once in a while, right? I don't need to smell like an onion every day of the week. Not a, yeah, not a good idea. Yeah, glasses offer no protection because then they just fog up and then you're blind, handling knives, trying to cut onions. It's actually quite dangerous. So I know you mentioned maybe your mother didn't cook too much because it was a a different era, but is there one food, one smell or a food memory that really inspires you or brings back good memories? Uh, So growing up, uh, there was probably, I mean... There is the memory I talk about in my book that when we would go to New York City to visit my grandma and my aunts, we'd oftentimes drive up like after school and work on a Friday and arrive on a Friday night. And on the table would be challah at my grandmother's apartment. So that she always made challah for us. And she baked her challah, by the way, like into her early 90s. Um, she was still baking challah. So just that memory of walking into her apartment and smelling the challah is certainly like a big one for me. Connected to that, so growing up um, on when I was still on the East Coast, we used to go to my aunts in New Jersey and go to this huge flea market that was called English Town. And I used to love going, not so much for the flea market part of it. That's where my mom and my aunt loved because they were looking for like little antique finds and such. But at the end, they had these food stalls that were permanent there. And we'd always go in and get like fresh bagels and white fish and lost, just like the way you can on the East Coast. And then, and all of those smells from that, the food stalls. And then we'd go back to my aunt's house and make a huge spread. And um, so those are both like really like wonderful food memories from my childhood, um, for sure, uh, that are very, you know, East Coast based. 
I mean, the food scene on the East Coast, especially in New York, is just so amazing. It's the variety, the accessibility, just there's just so much amazing food and amazing Jewish food or Jewish adjacent food over there. I mean, I'll tell you a really quick story if there's time. My my cousin recently came out. They live in Long Island and his wife was texting me before they came, what can I bring that you can't get on the West Coast so easily? And she started listing possibilities and one of them was lox, like sm- fresh sliced Nova lox. And I guess my cousin was like, are you kidding? How are we going to bring locks on the airplane? But she went to her favorite place and got the sliced locks, froze it, brought it on the plane and brought it out to us. And it was just absolutely perfect when it got here. But you, I mean, there may be some place in California, but I haven't found it. The way they slice locks on the East Coast, like in the delis there... It's just not, like it was so beautiful. I wish I could show you. I took pictures of it. The way it was layered between the pieces of parchment and how finely but perfectly it was cut. And of course the flavor, I mean, the flavor was just so quintessentially perfect. Nova Lox in every way, not too salty, a little salty, just beautiful. Ah, I mean, that, if I... It was just like every bite of that was, that was like a little piece of heaven for me. Absolutely. I think that there's, I, I, you know what, I, I don't think I missed it until we spent about a week or so in New York this past November and I ate bagels and all of it on the daily, multiple times a day. And I really did miss it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there is, it's getting better, but it's, it's not. I mean, you know, most people here, when they have you over for bagels, lox, and cream cheese, we are getting better with the bagels. I'll give a shout out to Boy Chick Bagels, and there are some other ones. But almost always, somebody has gone to Costco and bought the double packs of the lox, which is not, it's not bad. But this sliced lox that my cousin brought me, I mean, what I just, until you've had it, you don't realize what you're missing. It was fabulous. And I mean, even I have that big Costco pack in my freezer because it's it's a really good deal. You can't beat it, price-wise at least. Besides deals, I also love Jewish holidays. So Beth, what is your favorite Jewish food holiday when it comes to food? So that's a great question. I guess my, my favorite Jewish holiday to celebrate is probably Rosh Hashanah because we have kind of created this tradition of having a huge group of people at our house, not always right on the holiday. It's usually the weekend between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And so the the warmth and love of having family and friends together like that is, that's really my most, most favorite holiday. And the food is always wonderful because everybody brings something besides all the brisket and chicken and all the challah and everything that I make, there's usually this super eclectic, wonderful set of food that represents what that person or family loves to eat. So in that way, I would say it's my favorite. But I will say that there is nothing quite like the the latkes and sufganiyak, sufganiyak and the fun of, of, of Hanukkah. I mean, Hanukkah was sort of, you know, it's not really our biggest religious and important holiday that really represents everything there is to know about what it means to be Jewish, but it's fun. And the story is fun and the food is fun to share and fun to make. So, um, and I do love from my book, I made sufganiyot and you can bake or fry it. So for people who sort of hate that big bucket of, you know, pot of, of oil in their kitchen, you can bake these and you'll still love the result. So, I, you know, I love the food at Hanukkah because it's just comfort and fun. Uh, but, but, you know, I could go on about that. I could argue why, you know, Passover is also, or, or the blintzes from that, you, that we have at the end of, to break the fast at Yom Kippur, but are also big on Shavuot. I mean, you know, blintzes, what can I say? 
love them. They're on my blog. Uh, so it's always hard for me to pick one. I know it's like picking a favorite kid again. I am asking those hard hitting questions here on the Not Your Bubby's Nosh podcast. I mean, I'm personally a big Passover kind of gal. I love the creativity that you need and just thinking outside of the box, trying to make um, a delicious, a delicious Seder meal, especially with modern twists. So my family is Ashkenazi, but my husband is Sephardic. So they eat things like rice and beans and corn and all these things that I was never allowed to eat. And um, it's been a learning curve to blend our own traditions together. And it took me a couple years to feel less guilty about eating a chickpea as a vegetarian. Um, but you know what? We're Sephardic-ish and I, I can do it now, right? I think we just have to do it in a way that we all feel comfortable and we all feel like we're doing enough ourselves and chances are you are. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's so true. That's so true. I'm hopefully going to be teaching a class at the Palo Alto JCC. We haven't firmed it up yet, but uh, in the spring. And part of it will be kind of looking, if it does come to fruition, it'll be looking a little bit outside what your maybe the typical stuff and getting a little bit creative and looking at maybe other, um, you know, ingredients or cultures to kind of influence your food and, and what you make to, to get you through the eight days of restrictions. Restrictions equals opportunities. And last question for you today is, what are you currently working on? What are you excited about? Tell me what's next for you. Yeah, yeah. So I'm working on lots of exciting things. I'm big into Thanksgiving. So there is a lot of Thanksgiving uh, happening on my blog and a lot of testing going on in my kitchen. And I even wrote an article for AISH, A-I-S-H dot com about finding connections between Thanksgiving and Judaism. And I did a challah stuffing recipe. So love Thanksgiving. I am doing uh, a, what I'm calling Donuts Across the Diaspora, uh, an event for the International Association of Culinary Professionals on December 4th. And it is not members only. There is a fee. It's I think 25, 20 or 25 for members, but 25 or 30 for non-members. Um, and that's on Sunday, December 4th at noon East Coast time. So I'll be making sufgani oat and uh, uh, binuelos and probably Svenj will be the third one, the Moroccan donut. Uh, and I'm doing a lot of uh, live streaming and demos on a new platform called Kitch, which is K-I-T-T-C-H. They like to call themselves the like the food uh, platform for a new generation. But what I love about it is that as much as reels and, and TikTok are fun, I like to connect in a little longer form manner. And so I've been doing a lot of videos on Kitsch and it's so far, they're all free. I might start doing some paid classes, but please check it out. Um, there's all kinds of wonderful, um, uh, recipes and demos on there from for me. And it's again, it's free. Uh, just look for my name on kittch.com. So, and you can find me on my blog, omgyummy.com on uh, pretty much every platform. I'm omgyummy. Uh, so on Instagram, on Facebook, and on Facebook, if you really love Middle Eastern ingredients, I also run a cooking group called Tasting Jerusalem. We have all over 4,000 people in the group from all over the world uh, where we explore ingredients and cuisines of the Middle East. It started with a love for the Odalengi um, Jerusalem cookbook, but it's kind of expanded beyond that. But it's very ingredient driven. I run it with my first friend I ever made when I moved to California. Her name is Serene Wallace. And uh, it's wonderful. We, we um, you know, we always, I think people sometimes are afraid of new recipes or cuisines or whatever because they don't know an ingredient. So we kind of approach things from an ingredient perspective, get comfortable with the ingredient, and then you'll be able to in, incorporate it into your everyday cooking. And it doesn't always have to be the original way that it was used. Maybe you can find a new way to use it once you understand the flavor profile and what it is. So uh, you can find me at, at Tasting Jerusalem on Facebook as well. Um, find me on Kitsch, um, buy my cookbook, uh, support your local bookstore, or you can find it. And by the way, it comes in hardcover and softcover. They, it came out in hardcover in, August, in uh, October. 
The, ori- the original one was soft cover. The hard cover is wonderful. You can get it cheaper on the, the Amazon, but you can find it on uh, bookshop.org and that way you're supporting your local bookstores. Yes, buy 10 of them, give them to your friends. Um, I All cookbook authors will appreciate it and the people who receive them will too, I promise. If you'd like to learn more about Beth, check her out at OMG Yummy, buy her book, at least 10 of them, Essential Jewish Baking Book, and go give her a follow and maybe even check out her Tasting Jerusalem Facebook group. Thank you so much to all my noshers joining in. If there's someone you want to hear from, please let me know. Shoot me an email, shoot me a DM, or if you have a question about Jewish food, let me know because I'm here to help. Not Your Bubby's Nosh is a part of the Jew Folk Podcast Network and is produced by Jew Folk Inc. For more shows, check out tcjewfolk.com slash podcast. If you've got questions, email me at micah at noshwithmicah.com.